Mind Crime Limit Show with me, Swithin Dobson, and him, Tim Patton. Today we discuss, is murder wrong? Tim, um, why might murder not be wrong? Well, the, as we just said, we're going to discuss murder today. I think murder is one of the most under-argued things out there. Uh, murder's wrongness is sort of assumed, but if you dig deeper, it doesn't really seem... The justifications for this act seem rather uh, small and narrow and weakly argued. Uh, I'm going to get to my, my best two arguments, I think, for murder, which are emotivism and the divine moral command theory. Um, but but before I'm going to describe what murder is and whether it's wrong, I think I'm going to just leave out what murder isn't. So murder is not, to me, in general, murder is not denying um, someone's service uh, in general. Although sometimes good choices will make this argument that you know, capitalism is murder because if you don't have an NHS, you're denying people service. The consequentialist David Friedman would argue in the reverse Rawlsian way that, you know, if you don't have capitalism, you can't have enough incentives for doctors to create more service and innovate. So you can make the same sort of consequentialist type Rawlsian argument in favor of capitalism to eliminate the maximum, to create the most number of health cares. So you, you have the fewest number of deaths. So that that's so murder is probably not denying someone's service. Murder might be suicide. We've already done an episode on suicide. That's kind of like a self-murder. As a libertarian, I generally don't think suicide is self-murder. You're allowed to take your own life. This is a randy idea. Um, and murder requires some kind of intent. Uh, intent. Intent. Uh, so murder can't be if you if you're giving out if you're serving people like let's say you're serving people wine and you think it's wine, but it actually has poison in it and you don't know it has poison in it. And there's no real way you can know there's poison. That's you're not really murdering someone. You just you, someone you made a mistake. So knowledge is somewhat relevant to murder. A child who happens to find a deadly weapon isn't a murderer. Um, and interestingly, I don't think when animals kill humans, there are murderers. In even though the effect is the same, uh, like if a bear you know kills a human, that's probably not a murderer uh, murdering either. <clears throat> so. And now, now we're gonna, the final. This is this is going to relate into like why is murder wrong? Is you know is it just a justified killing? So like when the state does something, um, like you know let's say let's say the now outside of the Anabaptists when the Anabaptists hold a very pure view about murder, uh, the Anabaptist pacifists hold a very pure view about murder. You can't you know just because the state has a justified the state says this is a justified killing. Let's say going onto war with somebody based on just war theory. Um, or the state wants to go uh, kill, a, use capital punishment and say hang your executioner. You, most people generally don't say that doctor who's administering the lethal injection or the guy who's making the rope to and gonna, you know pull the, the chair out underneath him to hang him, not a chair, a trap door, whatever it's at the gallows. Um, those, those people generally aren't considered murderers. But by action, a soldier who's dropping a bomb or those things is technically by action – air quote, a murder, but then they would say, well, that's a justified killing. And to what extent a murder versus justified killing is one of the topics I want to get into, uh, which I think is going to illuminate some positions here. But I think the wrongness of murder is important because it's probably the most important political question if you really sort of underneath a lot of political philosophy. Uh, you know, murder is relevant because it's – because you know that's what the state traditionally does. It administers justice. You know, if you take the Habergeon account of the state, uh, you know, we need – we need the state to uh, punish the murderers uh, and to stop each other from killing themselves. We need this Leviathan. Um, and we also, if you take the social democrat view, uh, same thing. You need the state to administer health care. You need the state to, to go after the fascists, of course, uh, and put physically remove all the you know far right people. That's what if you really dig down to them because they're all murderers. And if you ask the sort of right wing people, you need to deal deal with the um, you know the far left. You need to administer justice and so forth. You deal with heresies. Uh, this is, if you take a Catholic, you know, sort of status Catholic view, uh, you know, and if you, if you boil down, to, you take the end of the argument. Why is that wrong? Well, heresies or wrong think um, leads to harm. At the ultimately harm is aggression, which leads to death, and it leads to killing. It leads to murder. Now, of course, the classic example of murder is I go just out on the street, hypothetically, of course, and I just, you know, kill somebody. Um, you know, just randomly. That's sort of like a random serial killer. Although, although in, in theory, most murderers don't, aren't people you know. Um, and actually, most historical crimes, if you take the Hummel's work, now this goes back to why I think murder is a relevant philosophical, political question. Almost all 
you know, <clears throat> you know, why is Stalin wrong? Why is Hitler wrong? Why is, you know, whatever boogeyman you have? And even for the libertarians, why is Woodrow Wilson wrong? Um, you know, why are these people all wrong? Well, they're murderers. Now, again, you could say, well, they're doing justified killing. And by legal theory, if you go into the work of like Carl Schmitt and so forth, by legal theory, you could argue that they're actually just doing justified killing based on the laws of the land. Uh, you know, is, are those things actually wrong at the time? It's not entirely clear. Uh, we've already done some episodes on what is justice and what isn't justice. Um, so, so that goes back to that thing. But my, my favorite two arguments for like why is murder wrong is divine moral command theory and emotivism. And I, I'm going to start with emotivism because I think I think this actually gets at the reasoning which people uh, in principle use. Uh, and I'm going to give you some time, and time to respond, and we'll go into depth more so. Uh, emotivism is interesting because it, 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 if you push people, well, you know, why is murder wrong? I, I basically think people are making it, this is the emotivist claim, that just, all they're saying is boo murder or boo harm. Now, of course, you know, if you ask people what's wrong with harm, well, harm eventually, if you do enough harm, will lead to murder. It's sort of a continuing problem. You just chop off your toes. You just keep, you know, you keep sucking your blood out. Eventually, you're going to kill a person or you keep drowning them. There's lots of ways to kill, but you, you eventually end up with um, murder. Uh, and interestingly, one of the things that brought this up was uh, Ben Burgess was in, in a debate on Modern Debate series with uh, a pastor. And he also had a prep video where he was had the brought up this Rawls versus not Rawls, uh, where he brought up this um, uh, debate between William Lane Craig and Kagan. Um, and, you know, one of the comments that someone made on the Kagan thing is that that, that Kagan was probably just basically arguing uh, mur murder is wrong because it, it causes harm. And this is where I think it gets circular. Why is harm wrong? No one really ever says why harm is wrong. Well, let's say, well, well, humans have a special complex nervous system or humans are worth things or the human community says they're worth things. Um, and and I, I've never really found these type arguments convincing. Um, but the emotivist claim to me is interesting because it, it, it looks sort of stupid on its front. You know, all he's saying is boo, murder, boo, murder. But but if you really push people, I don't I don't really see any reason why else. I don't see any better reason to say things are wrong. Uh, well, I don't like it. And it's, it's the analogy here is I don't like I chocolate ice cream. Some people don't like vanilla ice cream. Well, that that's fine. But I think actually that that's probably about as much we can do when it comes to murder in a universalizing. One of the comments that um one of the comments that um uh uh I can bring up a second theory before I get to divine moral command theory um, is that Ben Burgess interestingly brought up. And this is, I think, what one of the flaws of sort of the golden rule or Kantian type reasoning here is now I'm not I'm not a stalker. Uh, ben Burgess offered this example, but Ben Burgess was dealing with his nephew, interestingly, and he said um, his nephew took something of his. And now, again, to it is worth pointing out that most socialists do have private personal property. So what's wrong with stealing one's personal property? Uh, well, this was Ben Burgess' answer he provided to his nephew. Again, I'm not a stalker, but he offered this example. He said, well, Bert, would you want that to happen to you? Would you want me to take your, your things? Well, and uh, his nephew gave a very good Sternerite response. And his response was, uh, I can take your stuff, but you can't take my stuff. Which I think is, I think that's a sort of brilliant reasoning um, out of this sort of sort of Kantian ut universalizing thing. Well, you don't want to do things wrong because if I killed you, would you want me to kill you? Um, so if you think of theft or taking like a small piece of purple is analogous to murder, which I do, as Rothbard argued, murder is a kind of property crime or body stealing. That uh, uh, would you want to do that? Uh, would you want to do that? Well. You could you could just get out of that and say, well, I want to take your things. You could take my things, but I'm not going to let you take my things. And you get out of this. I mean, th this is where this is where I think most secular arguments about murder's wrongness have their limitations, and they're not that persuasive. Because you could say, well, I'm different. That's one option. I'm better. That's another option you could say. You could say, well, you could take try to take my stuff, but I don't want to. Interestingly, the the idea that the state is allowed to kill people is in itself an exception to the rule of murder being wrong, uh, whether it's in through war or whether it's through the capital punishment. The state being allowed to kill people is 
a huge, you know, elephant sized exception, which people like the Anabaptists and the, you know, left wing pacifists and the right wing, you know, libertarians would point out, uh, you know, through various measures, the state is probably the biggest murderer. Uh, uh, so now, again, the statists would always say, well, those are justified killings based on just war theory or, or some other thing. Uh, but but it is it is a huge exception there into that. So I've been I've been rambling on to a certain extent about, you know, why I think murder is being under argued. And I really only think the argument the secularists can come up with is it's wrong because the community says it wrong. But it's quite rational at times to kill just, oh, well, we'll just kill your whole community. <laughs> It, you know, it's rational for me to kill your whole community. That's fewer people to me to compete with. So, so let's let's do that. Then you then then you can't say you have a group of people um, that think it's wrong. Well, you know, if I kill your whole family, then 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 there's no one there to miss your loss. You know, it. Why not? Why not go full Genghis Khan or full Stalin or full? I mean, interesting. North Korea has this sort of punishing system as well. Um, to make you disappear to a certain extent. So, so I, I, I find the secularists, the really only argument they can make is emotivism, which is weak in some ways, but it's, it's strong in the sense that it's somewhat persuasive in a way. But I don't know how thick it is in the libertarians, in the, in the libertarian parlance that way. So the way that I've been rambling on, what do you make about my comments so far about murder being under-argued? Do you think it's under-argued? Um, and do you think the sort of general secularist really only has motives. And what's your comments on the sort of, you know, the, the story I brought up about Ben Burgess and uh, utilitarianism as well as Kantian? I would say I would agree with um, your statement just, um, that murder is in a sense under argued. In a way, it's parallel to um, slavery in, in one respect. Um, no one ever says, well, why is slavery wrong? You know, you always just assume that slavery is wrong without actually arguing as to why slavery may or may not be bad um and that's the same with murder um now why is that the case i think probably and i think you're right that um the sort of basic more basic ethical questions can't really be adequately uh dealt with um with um a sort of uh, materialist view of reality that in which there's just matter in motion. Um, I, 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 I think there is very little way you can actually make these claims. And so when you do do ethics, um, what you can do is you can you can talk about sort of more elaborate areas and then effectively what you can you can justify them on the basis that your intuitions are correct. You basically have some intuitionism. But since in most cases, people generally have these sort of intuitions as being true, then it looks as though these sort of you're, you're making progress, as it were, with these ethical questions. Now, you might you probably are insofar as the intuitions are correct. But then there's very little way, if any, to evaluate the truthfulness of the intuition. And I do think you're right. I think in general, people just um, think, well, murder is wrong because they don't like the idea of murder. Now, I don't think that necessarily implies you need to be an emotivist in a technical sense. But I think that's the mo reason most people would say murder is wrong. Um, you've alluded to the fact that emotivism is quite thin. Um, the issue, I think, with emotivism uh, is it is basically contentless. Uh, this was uh, what this was Roderick Long's critique of emotivism, emotivism when he did his um, libertarianism and um, ethics series he did a number of years ago at the meetings even like 10 years ago now if not longer um, and basically um, Long's claim was that you can't um, you can't construct a valid syllogism although actually no 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 Long's, Long's claim I think might have been on aesthetics but it equally applies to um, to uh, ethics so, so for example if i was to put this syllogism together on an emotivist view in according to long and i think he's correct this actually doesn't make any sense so i can make the following claim i could say tim is a man murdering a man is wrong therefore murdering tim is wrong which would seem to be a valid syllogism um but the problem is uh well murdering you know, or murder, if I say uh, to murder, Tim, I mean, if murder is just like boo, 
well then nothing follows from boo but it has no conceptual content so I, I think emotivism really just ends up being in irrationalism really and uh it's not just sort of like a relativism about ethics it's a relativism about everything um when it comes to emotivism which i think is generally the case um so that uh would be my take on emotivism um and i, I agree with you your, your things about you know oh my family wouldn't like it if it happened it's like yeah what if they're dead um etc and you you pick people around the world or something like that and you know why do i care um and just on a sort of purely sort of um secular view that in sort of a materialist one i've described before doesn't really have much of an argument uh, against it and i agree as well when it comes to sort of like ben burgess's nephew with this sort of sternerite um response that um yeah why not just treat yourself as different why not treat yourself as a napoleon figure why not treat yourself as the exception to the rule um now the question is well why could you um distinguish yourself from the rule and i think that really sort of gets to what i think is this is somewhat tautological um but i don't think it trivial necessarily is to say that well murder is sort of like an, un, an unjustified killing now but then the question arises well what is in fact justified uh, which you've alluded to uh so far um and i would say you you've highlighted that you think there's a motivism or divine command i would argue that there is a third option uh which i think uh, could be uh explained via sort of natural law uh view if you take the view that um, man is by nature a rational animal uh, and is also a social animal, uh, you um, it built into what an individual actually is, uh, is a necessary uh, relationship between the individual and somebody else. And which then sort of fosters a more sort of. Hmm, as a communitarian ethics or, or, or more of a case of um, that what happens to other people uh, matters to you in nature in virtue of who you are uh, because for you to flourish as an individual you need to flourish in a society now of course you could then make the claim that well yeah what are people not in your society or actively or just far away from you such as they have no direct link um to sort of your sort of flourishing as uh, an individual uh which would be something we could possibly go into later but i i think that sort of the natural law position um is a potential third option between uh emotivism and uh, divine command theory the point about justified killing being somewhat tautological is key uh and you know what 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 are things what are items or uh essences or categories of objects or persons are you allowed to kill um like one of the ways take take thomas jefferson or aristotle both of them had slaves and it doesn't really seem that they had any problem with owning them if interestingly enough one of the today some vegans and animal rights people would say that owning uh owning you know killing cows you're murdering cows it's no different than murdering a human um, um, they can feel pain and so forth. And once you get up, well, in, there's something else you could eat. This is not the case for a lion. A lion can only eat meat. So for a lion to eat, they have to eat the zebras and the cows. Um, but 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 something like for someone like Aristotle or Jefferson, probably you know they just if you view if you view the slaves as uh, just like cattle, which is a, which is based on an econ great econ talk about that, which is the Greek view. Uh, as 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 being sub uh, in fear, which goes back to the point about uh, viewing yourself as the exception or viewing others as the exception to the rule, which is the way the law viewed slaves in in slave society. Don't view them as part of the community, so to speak, uh, for better or for worse. Um, um, you can sort of get out of 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 slavery, and and by definition, you can get out of murder. You're not really murdering people. Beads aren't considered. Uh, people, uh, you know, 
you know, and actually, the, and, the, and if you go back to the sort of Wilsonian idea of scientific racism, for better or for worse, you can get out, you can, you can get that point as well easily. Uh, so, so the idea, which comes, which is what, what goes to back the point that Craig versus Kagan debate made, is that you know Craig said, you know, to Kagan, well, you know, what's so special about complex nervous systems? And, and, and Kagan said, well, what answer could I actually provide with you to answer that question that makes complex nervous systems go complex? I find it interesting that Kagan is defending the idea of a complex nervous system as the sort of, you know, the thing that makes people, so to speak, people special. Uh, because, you know, would Kagan think that someone who's born, who can't talk or can't read as being OK to murder? Now, the eugenicists would have no trouble doing that. Uh, you know, the eugenicists in that regard have no trouble doing that, that they're, they're, they don't have a complex, they don't have as complex of a nervous system. And I do find when the people, the animal rights people, I just sort of want to have more consistent, uh, the animal rights people, they seem to have a, a rank order of animals, which seems to be based on intelligence. You know, like if you, if you don't have any trouble killing moths, like what, 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 if, if you, if you cry when, when an elephant or a dolphin gets killed, but you don't have any trouble killing moths when you take drive your electric car around. I'm going to use an electric car just to be nice. Uh, you know, because you, you know, if you look at your windshield, if you're in an area like I am, you're going to kill about 100 moths if you drive. Um, um, if you drive. Um, um, so, so you know, what, what's, what's the difference between killing a moth and killing a, an elephant or a dog? I mean, dogs might have more complex nervous systems. Um, so humans have the most complex nervous system, arguably, or yet to be known. So the the complexity point to me has some problems, and and I, I I'm going to get into dividing moral command theory, which I think is somewhat related to natural law theory, maybe, maybe. But what do you make so far about my point that this was made in the Kagan Craig debate here as well. Um, what do you make about the complex nervous system with it in regard to, you know, the point about Aristotle and slavery? I think the complex nervous system argument is on the well, it sounds somewhat arbitrary, but I, I think if you link it to reason directly, I think you then have uh, a better case now I suppose you got an emergencist view or to what extent is, is is that plausible or do you need sort of like insolvent by God or something like that to sort of get a rational agent but um, it seems to be the case that uh, moral action is about knowing and doing and to know something well you must have reason otherwise you, you don't know it because knowing means knowing a concept um, and so if it is the case that it is only the complex nervous systems that can do this, well, then that would and they 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 uh, have the ability of to reason. Well, then that would categorically uh, distinguish them from everything else. And, and also, crucially in this context, um, that if you are a rational agent, you're also a moral agent because only rational agents can be moral agents. We should then give you a reason to treat um, to treat uh, humans differently because well they are in fact moral agents and you know they are ones that you therefore should treat differently and have reason to do so because they are in fact moral agents and also for the fact I, uh, the the argument I've given uh, prior to that about man being in nature a social animal um, so I, I do think reason. Uh, is the main thing here and it just happens to be the case that complex nervous systems are the things which um which allow for that at least as far as we know with biological creatures the question then arises though well you know what about the retarded what about the child etc they don't reason um well the the response to that is that Whilst they may not currently exhibit what we might consider fully rational behavior, um, it is of their nature to they are directed towards becoming that. Um, you know, in the same way, oh, how many eyes do people have? Well, two. How many legs have two? Or as a guy with no legs, is he human? It's like, well, well, yeah. It's just so happened to have some biological defect which stopped the manifestation 
of that taking place. So as it were, the proper accident of the, the two legs just hasn't taken place. In the same way, you could make the case with that with sort of functioning uh, reason, uh, which then I think not clearly uh, gives a justification for the view that um, we should treat all humans how stupid, retarded or injured uh, as sort of genuine moral agents who have a qualitatively higher value than uh, other animals. Now, that said, it is interesting, though, uh, when it comes to how you ought to treat other animals, that it seems to be the case that most people take that you have. Maybe you don't have obligations towards them. Or maybe you could say you might have some sort of negative obligations such as, well, or maybe you have different. Well, what I think is this. I mean, wielding a, like, uh, an axe at a tree it's fine. So what? It's your tree. But let's suppose it was your dog and you decide, oh, I just need to cut the dog up. People would go, well, that's kind of wrong. Uh, so then the question arises, well, what's the difference between the tree? I think there, I think you could make an argument of consciousness and I think an argument of pain. But then you could, you could argue that I'm kind of going down the sort of uh, animal rights um, view. Although I don't think I am. I think there are some things which are relevantly persuade, um, persuadable, persuading, influential. I can't remember. The, I can't think of the exact right word or from sort of the animal rights uh, view. Um, but I don't think it means that they go to, to human level for the reasons I've outlined before. So um, the complex nervous system, I think, is just a the physical manifestation of reason. And I think reason is the is the big difference is is the big distinguisher between animals and humans and why one ought to treat them differently. Uh, so I in a sense agree with Kagan here rather than Craig well in this regard I think in terms of the, the theist theories the best one to me the best most consistent moral theory in a way to me is divine moral conveyance theory of the Christian with the ultimate with the, in particular taking these sort of ten commandments um, uh, somewhat seriously uh, uh, now the critique of the demanding moral command theory is it somewhat goes back to you for a dilemma, but the sort of hardcore Calvinists, the, the, what people call the angry Calvinists at times, will eat this dilemma and say, well, couldn't God create a world where there's murder is allowed and these other things are allowed? Uh, and the answer is yes, to a certain extent, that is that is the case that he could create a world, um, you know, that it's it's possible. And this is where sometimes the the secularists when they critique the DMC, um, in a way, proved too much. You know, a lot of times they'll cr criticize the Old Testament for God, you know, punishing, you know, sending a flood to kill all humans. Well, you know, God's allowed to kill all, you know, punish, you know, all of Earth. But this doesn't entirely seem, you know, well, it's his property. That's one thing you could say. He can make the rules. Um, you know, the, the rules could be changed when he wants to. Uh, and it's like, sure, they're arbitrary rules. Um, but they are consistent in the sense that, you know, whatever God and God would say that humans are the centerpiece of thing. They're, they're made in his image in that way. They're very consistent. Now, for the once you get out in the real world of ethical reasoning outside the sort of, you know, sort of somewhat platonic theological realm. Now, the question began, who's a human? Who isn't a human? Uh, but once you can decide humans are more worthy than all animals, you know, animals are supposed to be underneath man's command. Humans are the you know, the pinnacle and particularly man you don't want to kill them because they have worth. I think I think the way out of all these sort of dilemmas to me is the divine moral command theory, because the problem to me with the natural law reason is, is at times there are people who are could be considered mad. You kill the people who are mad. You kill, you kill the people who are, uh, you know, handicapped or disabled. They don't have sort of perfect reasoning power uh, either. So there's, there's a huge exceptions here, uh, exceptions here uh, that, that, you know, in a way almost inv invalidate the rule to a certain extent and can be applied there. So to me, the most consistent way through all these dilemmas is my moral clan theory. But of course, it's it's very arbitrary and there is alternate ways you can make it. Now, now, now Craig, Kagan would say, well, why, why does, 
you know, why do we have to listen to him? Why do we have to apply what those other gods? Of course, those are all those are all you could, you could ask those questions. Um, but but in the same way, you know, I could just say, Craig uh, Kagan, you know, why should I care about other complex nervous systems? I somewhat care about my complex nervous system, but I don't really see why I should care about your complex nervous system. Uh, it it doesn't really affect me. Now, you could try to make an argument. Well, killing is not really good for you to kill me because I might provide you some value or there's some related way in which you don't want to come back to hurt you. But that goes back to the Sergio Sternerite exception here. It won't come back to help harm me. It'd actually be rational for me to do it. Uh, why not? Why not? Uh, now, this is this, this, the DMC person would say, well, God will punish you eternally. And that that that's that that's that's a way to, you know, there's no higher form of justice and God will punish you eternally. Uh, so 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 that that's sort of the way out of it. And that's the sort of persuasive way. Out. That's why I to a certain extent find it persuasive. So when people critique, you know, the God being overly angry, it's sort of as well, that, that's that's actually a feature in your way. Wouldn't you want your favorite boogeyman? Let's say you wouldn't you want. You know, if you if you think, you know, Mr. Trump is a terrible murderer, wouldn't you want him to be punished? Uh, or no, I don't. This is, well, depends. Complicating. Um, if you think you sit your favorite boogeyman, wouldn't you want him to be punished? Uh, so that's the way the DMC has sort of a, a persuasive mechanism and a sort of out of all these sort of theoretical handicaps. So what do you think are the merits of DMC? What do you think are the, you know, demerits of DMC? And what do you think are the failures of the theory. Swithin? Well, as you pointed out, uh, the big problem with the Mein Kampf theory is that it seems to be arbitrary. It seems to take a view that uh, God can declare anything without any res internal restraints at all uh, as to what is what is moral or immoral. That would seem to be the, the biggest flaw. Um, I mean, it's perfectly possible to say, you know, you could you, God could have created a world with no moral agents, with no rational beings. And so anything that happens, happen, that does happen, is not morally, morally relevant on that basis. Fine. That's perfectly plausible. Could have happened. But to say that you could create a world in which there are rational, moral agents... Uh, and you would be justified in treating them the same way you would treat a non-rational um, animal, then, or that would be right to do so, more precisely, that seems false. Because I, I think it can't, it doesn't recognise sort of the fixity, the sort of, the, the substantial being of things in the world. It just sort of creates some merely as a product of will. Now, obviously on a theistic view, what the, the, the appropriate the, the way you relate sort of God's causation and the causation of the thing together, sort of secondary causation is not straightforward, but um, at least you can sort of hold that up and go, well, OK, there is something about the nature of the thing which determines the morality, which then makes it rationally explicable. Now, that said, I mean, uh, William Lane Craig, I believe, takes the view, I think, that uh, well, God couldn't have created the world in which sort of murder was good because he takes it. I think he says that God is by his nature good. And therefore, we'll only command that which is good. And I think this is his sort of response to the euthero dilemma and also is a way of attempting to avoid the arbitrariness of um, forms of divine command theory. I think Occam held um, sort of like that form of divine command theory. My understanding is Islam does as well, actually. Uh, Islam basically treats that uh, God is so higher and different than everybody else. He can basically do what he wants. Uh, and um, is I don't know if I've heard an Islamic uh, take on as to whether you God could have created the world in which murder was good, but my impression from the Islamic view of God, I think he possibly could, but don't quote me on that. I I, I don't know that for certain. Um, 
but 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 yeah but but craig says you know god is good therefore god only commands that which is good so it's it's a classic solution to the you throw dilemma which is try to collapse um the goodness and the command to do the goodness in one and the same thing and not require it to be separated Mm -hmm. the trouble to me with this theory is it makes good independent it it sort of leaks towards making good independent of it and then you can just you try to figure out what the goodness is independent of it which again that's not that's not to a certain extent the you know the uh topic of this discussion you know why is murder wrong although in some ways all for a question this important almost everything is 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 there's no almost everything is merited and i'm sort of to a certain extent uninterested in what craig himself has as his personal view um i think there's a certain continuum um between you know you know you have a sort of uh, views uh, at, at times. So, so he, he is correct. In an interview, he states he he is the paradigm of moral value. He said this is not in this very interview here. But uh, that so we laid out sort of a motivism. And I think in practice, I think at the first level, you know, if you're or if you're replying to someone, you know, why is murder wrong? Well, why would you want to do that? And then you might sort of work up to. Uh, but but as you say, you can just come up with these sort of certain right exceptions to it. Um, and I. And then the second level you move up to is like, well, you don't want this to happen to you, which is some like some version of the golden rule. Again, that might be persuasive. It might work. I don't think it works very well. Because again, you get an exception, and you, then you get the higher things like natural law or divine moral command theory. Uh, um, you, 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 you in general are sort of an Aristotelian natural law uh, in general. Um, between the two, Swithin, which do you think is more Pertian and why? Like, what? Why do you accept um, natural law theory as a better argument? Um, I, I accept divine moral command theory because I don't. I think, because I think if if God is true, if He is true, there is a certain arbitrariness to it. Uh, uh, and I'm not. I don't really. It, it's sort of beyond reason. It's beyond knowing to a certain extent. Uh, we can try to know it, but it's somewhat of a mystery in that regards. Uh, we can we, we might be able to come up with sort of rules, but the, the exceptions and things like that. So it just sort of lays it down. It's wrong because he says so. That's something like the angry Calvinist will say, uh, you know, it, it just bite the arbitrariness bullet and sort of wear it as your badge of honor almost. Uh, what do you what do you make? Like, why do you interpret the natural law theory, which I seem to be your theory? So then, as I alluded to before. I think that the, the problem was I think Craig's divine command theory is is a sort of a non-arbitrary form. And I, I, I think I think that kind of uh, makes sense um, insofar as it goes. My objection to it is that it doesn't give appropriate weight to the nature of things and the nature of things being able to. And, and knowing what things are, you know, figuring out what is good for them. I mean, so for example, I mean, everybody now you could say this is arbitrary, but I, I don't think it is. I mean, you can look at like a tree and go, you, you can go, okay, this is a good tree, this is a bad tree. You know, what makes it a good tree? Well, it fulfills, you know, what treeness is. You know, it is a good tree. You know, it grows large, it has big roots. You know, it, it, it's doing what a tree should do. I mean, this seems to be uh, something you can just look at reality and you go, OK, yeah, there are things and objects in the world which have their own sort of inbuilt sort of um, uh, structure and directedness. And the same thing applies to humans. And why is it morally relevant in the in the, in the human case? Well, because humans aren't, are, are rational. Um and so therefore a part of the moral community, as I sort of tried to out- outline earlier. Well, that, that that basically sums up, you know, the, the differences, you know, reason, they have some inbuilt preference and so forth. My, my general pushback is, well, humans could do other things. You know, you could humans could have multiple preferences, even if humans are acting contrary to what you prescribe as their nature. Do, are they still humans? I don't know. There's a certain, there's a certain simplicity I'd argue to this, where well, regardless of what they're doing, you shouldn't murder them. Um, now, I'm going to move to the second. But, but, so sorry, but I, I wouldn't say that. Okay, when I say you shouldn't murder them, uh, it's more of a case of well, obviously yeah, it depends 
into murder. But it's um, you could do other things. It doesn't mean you're not human. I mean, uh, so you can you, under the Aristotelian view, you can use things which uh, is not uh, was not what the, the nature of the object is. So, for example, I mean, you, you can use a tree as a like in tree down in terms of barricade. I know it's not technically a trick at that point. It's just wood. Um, but, you know, that's a, a different use for the tree. And that's kind of bad for the tree, as it were. Um, so having multiple uses or kind of, I don't know, uh, for example, your arm has been severed uh, and it's on the ground and you're being attacked. So you get your set, you pick up your own severed arm and like smash it around someone's head. You know, that's not in the nature of the arm, but it doesn't mean it's wrong um, to do so. So I think there's the, there is more nuance um, that I think you're um, you're giving credit for in the Aristotelian view. Oh, and also, this is the thing I've forgotten, which I was going to say. Um, you know, what makes people human, what doesn't? As I said, all humans are rational, even if they are in a coma. Because that's the same thing with, with, with rationality. You know, if you're asleep, are you rational? Well, maybe not at the moment. Uh, but you'd still recognize that you are actually a rational agent, despite you being not rational and uh, being unconscious. Um, so we intuitively accept the fact that you don't need to be consistently engaged in rational deliberation to be considered rational. Um, and so even though your ability to reason may be frustrated, it doesn't mean you're not a rational agent. And basically, insofar as you look like you're using language you look sort of bipedal. Uh, you have basic human uh, physiology, what, what we think is basic human physiology. You basically think that they're human unless otherwise, unless there's indications to the contrary. I mean, so you have these sort of debates when you had sort of the Spanish um, colonization of South America. And this would get the, the natural slave, actually, um, was... Um, some of them argued that the, the the Indians didn't have reason at all and therefore were natural slaves in a strict sense. They were basic animals. They had no conceptual thought at all. But I think, was it De Cassis or was it Vittoria? I can't remember which one. Basically said, no, 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 look, they have religion. They have their own religion. They, they clearly um, kind of have um, s s uh, social units in the way that we do in Spain. You know, they're obviously human. Um, and I think that's sort of like the epistemological question. But I think it's a relatively uh, straightforward one in most cases. The when, when different sort of cultures clash, there is a sort of, you know, friend enemy distinction here that sort of plays out where, you know, I, I don't I don't see a clear way out of this. Um, I don't I, I just think DMC is the best way out of it. But you, I, I can see why reasoning you could come to similar clues, you could come to different conclusions. And there is a sort of there is a sort of relativism behind by its arbitrariness behind DMC in the sense that there's alternate alternate you know, well you could just say, well there's alternate there's alternate realities where different things are the case, uh, and so forth. So so that that's why I would say the strength the strength. Um it is to me sort of in a just so manner, uh, the difference between animals and humans and so forth. Uh, so I'm going to move out of that sort of sort of question and more into sort of different types of question, which is which is what is justified killing? Uh, because that's related to murder. Uh, because as I brought up with the slaves, in some slave society, you can kill your slaves because they're just your property, or and it's easy, it's fairly easy to get away with doing it um, if you have some amount of power. Uh, so even if you can't, you, you, you're not going to have much, uh, you know, evidence or gathering or things like that. So. So the question is, what is justified killing? And I brought up the Anabaptists here. The Anabaptists don't serve in the military or the police, for example, because they think those are jobs that will have to be doing killing. And since they don't think that whether they whatever their position on the just war theory is, they think just war theory is an empty box and that there's no such thing as a just war. And by empirical standards, they often are at least somewhat correct uh, uh, that there are no such things as just wars. So in that way, the Anabaptists would say, well, thou shall not kill. That doesn't that includes foreigners. Uh, you can't kill foreigners, um, therefore you can't join the military. Um, now, again, if you want to think, follow that line through, there, there, there might be ways in and out of that. Um, maybe the state has an exception, or maybe individuals get an exception if they've been murdered and now they can engage in capital punishment. Um, that might be that might be an exception for when one one is allowed uh, to murder. I think Stefan Kinsella, for example, with teeth. 
Uh, this is more related to property crimes. But as I pointed out with Rothbard, he views murder as you know, two teeth for one uh, based on damages. Um, so, so Swithin here, what, what exactly for you is justified killing? It was clearly nullified. You know, when someone just happens to serve, you know, it's, it's accidentally that doesn't even know that it is poison and gives it out to everyone. That's not really murder. Um, that's not really murder. You know, someone, you know, if someone's driving along their car, you know, the, the accelerator gets stuck. Now you might blame the, the mechanic or the maker of the car, but you know, that's, they're not intentionally murdering them, but their accelerator got stuck or their brakes fail and they, maybe where they crashed the car could be classified as murder. Uh, but you can't really say that they're a murder in the same way someone knowingly with intent um, drove it in. And what do you make of my state versus non-state or, you know, justified versus non-justified? Like, let's say, you know, feud system that David Friedman says, if you killed my father, I would have I had reason to go kill you or something like that. He goes up in Hammurabi's code as well. So this comes goes more into justice, but it is related to murder in the sense, you know, why is it wrong? Why is it okay for me to do that? So with them, when it comes to uh, your examples with respect, you know, like unintentional, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to make the case that uh, unintentional killing is murder. Although uh, Alexander Proust does this with his some elaborate thought experiments, because you could claim, well, you know, I didn't intend to kill him. I just intended to, you know, to move, well, to, um, uh, move the parts of his skull to be arranged on the ground like a like a jigsaw puzzle prior to completion you could claim something like that so but in general yes and you know murder is intentional okay now the question is when is intentional killing not murder is 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 the interesting question and i suppose when i say well of course when it's justified but again what is justified it would i know sort of like um sort of the rational approach uh, based on natural law, I would say it'd be one of proportion. You know, is it um, is the response proportional? Uh, if it's proportional, then it's justified. If it's not proportional, it's not justified. Now you could say, well, you know, then I just push the problem back. You know, what is proportional and what's not? Well, I think an obvious one for justified killing would be, well, you know, if someone killed someone close to you um, in, who murdered them it was unjustified let's let's just bracket and say it was murder then it would seem perfectly reasonable and proportionate response to to exit well you could i can say i'm loading the dice by saying execution you can execute execute them that would seem to be perfectly uh, reasonable and proportional response um in the way that you know if someone accidentally sort of spills uh some water on you it's not sort of justified to go and like shoot them in the head because well that's just an unproportional response so i i would say it it, it depends on proportionality now of course you can get into questions like you know he did kill him but you know wasn't of sound mind you can all you can give all these caveats as to you know but but that what really that that raises is what is the actual nature of the original sort of murder to begin with and whether they're sort of like sliding scales of murder and do are there worse murders are there less worse murders less less worse murders and whether or not you know heinous heinous would be good word heinous yes yes heinous murders less heinous although all murders are heinous to some extent but more heinous um is you know what would be the proportional response so uh i would say uh so like in the feud system i mean if uh you had killed my father because he had you know decided that he didn't have as much um money oh well, i don't know maybe you want to take another wife you want to take your your mother and so you know your father tried to you know prevented him from raping her or kidnapping or something killed him in so doing and then you know you had a feud he's like oh no no he killed my father etc it's like well was he justified in killing his father? Yeah, probably. But when you, but you are right, though, when it comes to sort of like in-group, out-group, and that's certainly true, especially in war situation. But again, it, it comes down to proportionality. Uh, is it proportional to um, treat somebody from outside of your group uh, differently from them inside when you're at war with them? Well, well, yeah. The question then arises, you know, to 
you know, are very combatants or non-combatants. You can go for it, but there's lots of fine grade ways you can do it. But I would say ultimately the question is one of proportion. It it's still it still to me is an elephant sized exception. I mean, if you take the work of Hummel seriously, uh, uh, you know, this goes back to the first point. You know, the one of the primary areas of the state is is, is twofold: is, is to administer justice and to prevent us from kill, that's the Hobbesian account for the state is to prevent us from killing each other uh, uh, and to administer justice for those who did kill. Uh, but the state is based on normal, like normal, you know, ethical theory is allowed this exception by some, by some, although they want to do away with the death penalty, interesting enough. I'm fine with that. Uh, to go back to this sort of the, the punishment example, I'm fine with that. But, you know, if you ask, you know, if you ask the left, for example, you know, you know, should you do you want to kill? You know, do you think, you know, let's take one of boogeyman, Dylan Roof or something like that should be kept in a minimum security prison. Um, then 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 they sometimes recoil because uh, I just pointed out someone they don't like. They like it when they go. They like it when the, the crime they did, they don't think is an actual crime, which is brings up in the great Star Slater Codex blog about I can tolerate everyone except the outgroup. They, 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 they can forgive the crimes they don't actually think are crimes or they have alternate reasons for doing the crimes. So, you know, I, I find it interesting to go. This is like an ammo ranking. I have a sort of a war crime ranking um, where where, you know, firebombing Dresden killed about 50,000 civilians. You know, people say, well, you know, that was justified. Uh, but Jap the war with Japan now it's getting less. So the, the Vietnam War. So there seems to be a ranking of, you know, it's built, built for the left, at least it's built on the cause. And of course, the right might do the same thing. You know, if the Catholics, you know, the status Catholics might think, you know, going after certain Anabaptists or Lutherans was completely justified using their tactics. Uh, you know, uh, that they just lead to some sort of lunatic cult and murder them. So there is there is a way in which, uh, you know, the outgroup matters and, you know, what cause you're doing. But it's still it's still to me just an elephant excise exception. You know, if the U.S. government or the British government or the French government or the Chinese government is allowed to basically murder people. And again, this is where the statistical thing is like, well, is the state the most common murderer? I think there's a strong empirical argument to suggest that even if you take the counterfactual example seriously, that say if you got rid of the state, would that cause a vacuum and said thing? I still think there's a strong the Hummel empiric argument, the state's quite dangerous, uh, that this organization is allowed to justify kill people. Um, and I don't, I've never could, I've never could um, find the specialness. This is actually Michael Humer's book, The Problem of Political Authority. You know, if murder is wrong, you know, why in particular is the state? Now you can say, well, it, it's an inconsistency. Uh, so then what is your take on this seemingly inconsistency? Is it an inconsistency? And, and on a more empirical level, do you do you agree with the sort of anarchist critique on this? Um, well, firstly, I, the, the question is whether you can make a, a distinction between the public and the private um, spheres and you know what might be uh, justified for the public um, sphere for the for those entrusted with the care of the community, for example, you know, is that is what can they do different from uh, what the private citizen can do? Well, I don't even think you need to make that distinction in this case. I mean, you can just go, Chris, I, I think it's plausible to say that, well, it might be perfectly reasonable for me to, uh, let's suppose I know for sure that, I don't know, the guy next door killed my wife. You know, I see, you know, in principle, it seems perfectly reasonable if I was to execute him myself. But the question is, well, in reality, is that really the best procedure, you know, just procedure matter? You know, would it not be better to have a trial so everyone publicly can see, no, 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 he is guilty. And so therefore, you know, him being executed was actually just, you know, because that performs some sort of function. You know, it because it, it might just look, well, I'm just an angry vigilante. Um, so even if you make this so fine. So we go to public. So even if it's a public official doing that, it's like, well, OK, that that's kind of proportional. Um, but when it comes to the state, so even if you grant the public private distinction, I'm, I'm ambiguous as to whether I, I, I don't know if I do. 
Um, but it's like, but then they take it even further and it's like, well, then the state can kind of do stuff that even the state, in the state can the state can tax the state can yeah you know, yeah yeah it can it, 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 you the state can do all sorts it's it's not that it's a, a procedural thing and actually better for good order if if a separate body did it than you individually it's a case of well they could do things that you can't do in any way even in principle even if you were to have a situation where or at least morally you could claim in a situation of statelessness you know for, for whatever reasons a failed state or whatever you you wouldn't be it wouldn't be justified for you to do this i suppose you could claim in a Cobbesian one uh way that uh, you or stern right view then you you may but you're like it's it this isn't actually sort of justified but they can do you have a situation of dual law and it is basically just it's not proportional it's not um it's it's not it's not symmetrical there's just a situation where the state has all these 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 huge obs- exceptions of of like justifiable remit for what they can do and then everyone else can can not do them and i mean so like no fi- you know i mentioned like treating people as, as um you're at war with different people you're not at war with well that's true as far as it goes but like in practical realm you know are the citizens of dresden actually at war with you no i mean if they were acting in a warlike manner or or doing some military installation type stuff well yeah fine but they're just in their houses. It's like, are they like, are, are they a legitimate proportional target? Well, no, of course they're not. Um, and that's true if it was um, an individual, which is true if it was um, true if it was the state. Uh, in 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 a different, yeah. So I I would entirely agree with the anarchist uh, critique when it comes to the, the state on these things. I mean it. It just allows the state to do things which are wholly unproportional. Yes, it does allow the state to do whole things of personal, which which in some ways to me undermines the case against murder. So I'm going to move the final thing is, is, you know, what do you make of of what's like private? I'll go back to this point. Uh, what do you make of private death penalty? So so one of the critiques of like, let's go back to our favorite topic, you know, a stateless society, anarcho capitalist What do you make of private uh death penalty enforcement you know because if you really boil down to uh one of the critiques of anarcho capistan or stateless society is it'll just be well we'll just have warlords going around doing vigilante justice and sort of the vigilante dis- distinction is something i could never quite understood um in particularly from integrally coming from the left for example because you could argue you could argue that you know you could argue that there's some certain the civil rights movement was a sort of insurgency. The U.S. Army War College has a thing on that. And they're sort of a non-state actor. They were creating, you know, using Malcolm X as the sort of Thaddeus Russell makes his argument that Malcolm X was sort of the, you know, the boot behind the, you know, the pacifist. Uh, you know, the king was the pacifist. Martin, Malcolm X was the boot behind it. We tried the firepower to, to get a deal. So you could argue that, well, they're just observing outside. They say they're a stateless actor. I find this interesting because the, the left seems to at times went both ways when it comes to justice regarding the state. The state's allowed exceptions, but that's basically what everyone pleaded at the Nuremberg, uh, the, the defense that, you know, we were just following what the state law was. You know, they changed the laws. We could do it now. We could do what we want. And actually, the Stalinists would make the same claim. Now, property is no longer legitimate. You can't call property crimes legitimate. It's not a crime. So I. I've never I've never quite understood the distinction visa the society. And to me, the in Kapistan answers this by saying private death penalty or now, the, now you can say, well, this is just a stern right view. But what do you make of the so air quote private enforcement of the, you know, death penalty? Like, let's say you let's say let's say let's say I killed your father and everyone knows I did it. Would you be justified in getting your insurance company or you know, or hiring hit squad to go take me out um, as punishment. Would that be just punishment? So then what, and what would you make of the more general context I brought this up in? Um, in a way, uh, yes, I do think it would be justified. Um, but what I would say is I would anticipate in the Ankapistan for that, as I said before, that there is a reason to have public justice in this sort of case. And by public, I don't mean necessarily 
funded by taxation, but like an open trial that people can see and go, okay, look, we've gone through it. Do we think he's guilty? Yes, yes. It's all pretty clear he is guilty. He's been found guilty, and then he's going to be executed. Because this provides a function for the rest of society to know that what I have actually done is justified. Because one of the problems is, uh, if I just do it and I know it's justified, and someone else doesn't. Well, then they might think my behavior was unjustified, and yeah, they think you're, they think they think you're a murderer, which goes yes, back exactly. to my first thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. If, if murder is wrong, you're doing the same thing. So I, so what you, so what you would need is some form of public, just uh, an open trial, still be funded privately by voluntary contributions, or you know, whole standard stuff. Um, but I do think it would need to be public in a way, and then this could. And then this would reduce the amount of uh, feuding that would probably take place. So in a way, I think in this situation, uh, part of the justifiability, you could say, is 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 the process itself. And I have to think about that a little bit more. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, I think that that would happen. And um yeah, and, and as I say, the state has a massive exception. I, I do think there are there are cases when you do recognise that some people can do things are legitimate, and some things you can't. So you know, you know, it would be justified for me to sort of berate my children to some extent when you think a random stranger wouldn't be able to do that uh, in the same situation. So you do rec- you that there are situations you recognise where you've got sort of asymmetric um, spheres of legitimate action. But when the, it's involved in the state, it, it just sort of takes it to such an extreme level that it just becomes absurd. Well, great, great. To, to back to the first point, I'm going to wrap it up here. I think murder in general is under argued. I don't, you know, as you said, it, people start with this premise and just sort of assume it. Robert Nozick does it with slavery. Uh, who know what right thinking person defends it. And I think he has a, a good point in the sense that no one on the left, for example, would openly defend, although it's a very weak reasoning, seemingly. I mean, if you get sort of into the weeds, it becomes even more more complicated because it, get, it gets even more complicated. So I think murder of wrongness is under is under argued, and there's two there's two exceptions, which we've done an episode on abortion and we've done an episode on suicide. So I don't think we really need to get into those two exceptions to the things: self murder or murder of fetuses or globs of cells or proto humans, whatever you want to call it. Can be the violinists example um uh but but those 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 exceptions we didn't even discuss but i don't think they're they're worth part but i i just don't you know i don't murder people for example for a variety of reasons some of them are because i fear god dmc theory theory, or to fear in a sort of pascal sense the dmc theory some of them are strictly emotivist you know uh i boo murder um and again to burgess and the utilitarian credit there is a consequence there is a certain amount where i don't i don't do a thing because i don't because you know they i wouldn't want that done to me but i, I would find those are, the more you get away from those things i think i think they're I, I don't i never found them to be persuasive because you could just always view yourself as the exception and you could view yourself as or you can view your opponent as not worthy of of being included and you say well that's a terrible move to do why not why not so the dmc to me is the the thickest one the one that that it is arbitrary but it's the thickest so i mean what what if you could quickly go through you know what what, what would be your rank order and i mean again i'll say thaddeus russell interestingly brought up a comment you know someone asking you why don't you burn me down in my studio if you don't agree with me well he said well i like your show and that's it says that's a good enough reason but that's that's not a very thick reason um, so when you make thick moral claims about the wrongness of things, if at bottom the murder is the most wrong thing, I just think it, it sort of weakens a lot of arguments, in particularly secular arguments. This is one of the reasons why I want to do this episode. I somewhat want to defang in certain ways when people say such and such is wrong. Why is it wrong? If you keep going back, it causes harm. You keep going back, murder is the worst harm. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do it. So overall, in conclusion, what do you think are the best arguments and any other final comments? <clears throat> well, I, I, I would say the natural law argument is, is, is the best argument, then probably followed by the um, the Craigian um, divine command theory and then emotivism. Um, whilst it's true, though, of course, that... Um, as I said before, but emotivism has um, some uh, some pull. Uh, 
I think ultimately the the reason why the basic questions aren't really dealt with in philosophy is metaphysics has been just got rid of. You can't have a nature of man because that's just all arbitrary. It's all sort of um, mystical. And so all you're left with is sort of intuitionism. And you just start with these intuitive moral claims and then try and work a system out from them without actually justifying the initial intuition, which you can't do really because it's just, it, in a sense, it's subjectivist. It's an internal one. Do, 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 do you assent to this, um, this, this intuitive starting point? And then go from there rather than trying to uh, establish that that starting point exists. Uh, then, of course, we get the question, you know, where can you start? Starting points are always, you could just say, is always a problem. Although I think that's less of a problem when it comes to sort of like what exists as opposed to what what should one do. Uh, that would be my sort of uh, final uh, statement on the matter for today. And now I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. If you've enjoyed this, please share it with your friends and family and subscribe to us on Podbean and YouTube. Um, the more subscribers we get, the higher we get in the search rankings and the more people can listen to the show. And if you'd like to contact the show for any reason, please contact us at mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com. That's mindcrimelibertyshow at gmail.com.